Actually, I know your paper says 1 John chapter 3, but we're going to actually start this in Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Alright? This is where we're going to start this class. And again, today's title is The Wages of Sin is Death. We're going to learn today why Jesus died on the cross for your sins. We're going to learn today why the Lord, when he returns, why he's going to destroy this place. As well as we're going to get some understanding on a little bit of what Paul wrote. Because Paul wrote some things for us to uh, get a comprehension of that we kind of comprehend a little bit after. But we're going to clear that stuff up today. So again, today's class is the wages of sin is death. I um, did have a class prepared for black history, but I ain't like it, y'all. So I was just like, you know what? Scrap that one. We're going to deal with this. And that's where we at. So we're going to start this off in Ecclesiastes chapter 8. And we're going to pick it up in verse 11. And so when you get there, go ahead and read because sentence, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set for them to do evil. Okay, so this verse right here it says because sentence against an evil work. Sentence is the reward. Or, for example, if you go to court and they you've committed a crime, then when they sentence you. They're giving you the reward for that crime or the punishment for that crime. So it says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. All right? So and most of us understand that when we have sinned in our life, we still alive. We have not died. And the title of today's class is the wages of sin is death. Or the sentence for sin or the payment or reward for sin is death. So it says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Because we're not... Killing people right now, Johnny on the spot, for committing iniquities. Go ahead. Though a sinner do evil. Therefore, I'm sorry. <clears throat> middle 11. Okay. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. So this is what's going on now. Because you don't get killed, Johnny on the spot, for committing iniquity. Now, people's heart are fully set to do evil. You see, if she had a prostitute and she was on the street. And while she's on the street, you know, as soon as she picks her John, next thing you know, angel come flying out of the sky and just start, you know, smashing her to death. All the rest of the prostitutes are going to run. They're going to be done with their job. But see, it don't work like that. It's like when you commit, when you in the store, you know, and you go, you know, steal some candy bars, you know, God ain't throwing you in hell immediately. Or even better, the, the store clerk not taking a bunch of bricks and just start throwing them at you. Even when they take you to jail, they give you a bond 
and say that you're innocent until proven guilty, and they let you go back free. So it says here, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore in our hearts, this, uh, we fully set to do evil. There's a reason why we just do what we do now, because we don't see punishment for it. That's why as parents, we try to punish our kids on the spot, so they won't do that type of stuff. You know, because we comprehend that if I let you, if I let you sit on it, you're going to keep on doing it. Like some people say, oh, you don't believe fat meat greasy. You don't think you're going to get in trouble for what you did. And that's how society is now. We don't feel like we're going to get in trouble for what we've done or what we are becoming as a society. But keep reading. Watch verse 12, say. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times. So it says, though a sinner continues to do evil. So one of the things we got to learn today is what is sin. See, because if you don't know what sin is, then you don't even know what qualifies yourself as being in trouble with God. But he says, though a sinner do evil a hundred times, what else? And his days be prolonged. Uh -huh. Yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear that fear God, which fear before him. So he's saying, look, but if you keep the commandments, even though a sinner can go out here and steal to get his money, or uh, murder or kill to get his money, or whatever the case may be, even though it may look on the surface like he's doing good, it's well with those that's going to serve God. Because there is a reward for the sin that you do. All right, keep reading, verse 13. But it shall not be well with the wicked, uh -huh. neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because fear not before God. Okay, can somebody call on oh, the line? I just thought about that. You get thank you. So he said, but it shall not be well with them, with the wicked. So even though the wicked might go out here like, you know, we see these, these, uh, these young hip-hop superstars, and they out there in the world, and they... You know, they do what they do, they spend their money lavishly, they throw these parties lavishly, and they also indulge in all types of fornications. And we look at that, especially our youth, and we like, man, it look good. And you don't hear about, you know, them getting in trouble for what they do. But what the Lord is saying, but it should not be well with the wicked. They will have their reward in due time. Just because I'm not punishing them now, don't mean you should go out there and do it and that you're going to get away with it. But we're going to learn about that. So let's now go into 1 John chapter 3 and let's find out what sin is. Because it's important for us to know what sin is because we need to make sure that we stay clear of this. See, that's part of the problem is that people have concluded or made up their own version or uh, uh, definition of sin. You know, like, oh yeah, it's a sin to go to a party. Or it's a sin to play some cards. Or it's a sin to have a drink. You know, it, things like that, people have put their own spin and twist. But the law is very specific on what sin is. 1 John chapter 3, verse, uh, verse 4. Not 14. Verse 4. And when you get there, go ahead and read. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? 1 John chapter 3. I'm sorry, my bad. First, you ain't even there. Say, this boy is in Peter. <laughs> Second Peter. First John chapter 3. And we're going to pick this up in verse 4. Whosoever commits sin transgress also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. So sin is when you break God's law. Or when you transgress the law. That's what sin is. So it says sinners going to go, they're they going to get punished for what they do. So sin is when you break God's law. Alright? Now let's find out exactly what God's law is. And what God's law really is, well we're going to read it. Let's go over here to John chapter 10. Because what we're doing right now is we trying to establish what the law is. Because we, before we can start dealing with sin, we got to deal with what the law is. Because the law is showing you sin. Like it say in Romans, I had not known uh, thou should not, I had not known thou uh, lust until he saw thou should not cut. You know, that's what the law does. The law explains and expounds to you what you can and cannot do. And we can't start establishing our own righteousness. Like, you know, I was dealing with a brother this weekend, and he wants to say, because now they start to do things like legalize the, the use of marijuana. That's what they, this is what the topic was this week. And no, I mean, yes, I can pass a urine test. So we're not talking about whether I indulge in marijuana personally. But the point or the fact of the matter was, another brother comes in and says, oh, well, just because they make it illegal don't mean we're supposed to smoke it. It's still a sin. It's still wrong. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, the Bible is very specific. 
You know, if you touch a dead body, you unclean until evening. If you eat some swine, you you know you you uh, you 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 eating an abominable act. If a woman is on her menstrual and you sleep with her, that's an abomination. Like the Bible is very specific. It does not say in the Bible, "Thou should not drink beer, thou should not play a card game, thou should not take a puff." It doesn't say that in the Bible. I mean, I'm sorry that it doesn't. Now, if you know you decide that I still don't want to do those things, that's fine. But when there is no law, you can't impute sin. You can't just make something. We don't set the boundaries of what sin and righteousness is. That's all I'm trying to get you to understand when we're saying this. Who does? God does. It's according to what comes out of his mouth. When he says it's law, then it's law. Okay? So if they happen to make it legal in Georgia, which I doubt they will. I just thought I'd let you throw that out there. Georgia would be one of the last states to do that in. But if they happen to make it legal there, and you see somebody, you go to somebody's house and it smells like, you know, herbal essence, don't be sitting there looking at them like they're sinning. Okay, but at the same time, the Lord requires us to be sober-minded. See, that's in the Bible. Read that. So therefore, you know, make sure that this ain't taking you to the brink the way you can't function. But then that's the same way with alcohol. That's the same way with partying. That's the same way with eating. Anything you do, you can overdo. But for us to just say, oh, that boy is sinning because he's smoking a cigarette. Who, who am I to make? The law is, sin is when you break God's law. Let's see some more stuff in here that the Bible is going to show us is the law. John chapter 10, verse 34. Go ahead. Jesus answered them, It is not written in your law. Is it not written in your law? I said, so, ye are God. So Jesus is walking amongst the people and actually he's dealing with the uh, Pharisees and scribes. And in this statement, because they were tripping on him about, uh, you know, saying he was blasphemy and saying he was God. So in the statement, he said, doesn't it say in your law, ye are God? Now, what we're going to do now is find where Jesus was quoting that from. Because now what we can understand and establish is that this is law. So let's go to Psalms 82. We're going to read one verse here. All right. So Jesus said, doesn't it say in your law? Okay, so now we're going to find out where was that statement made. Because that statement is law. Remember, sin is when you break God's law. Alright, so I'm, what I'm trying to do is make sin real clear for you. And by doing so, I have to clarify what the law is. Alright, so Psalm 82 verse 6, read that. I have said, ye are God, and all of you are children of the Most High. Okay, so Jesus... Didn't quote from Exodus, didn't quote from Deuteronomy, Numbers, Leviticus, or Genesis. He quoted from Psalms. And he said, doesn't it say in your law, ye are gods? So what we can qualify now is not only is, because everybody know Exodus 20 is law. You can go into James chapter 2 and then call that the royal law. And we can find, we got classes that will establish that all the law hang on these two sets of laws. On the royal law. You know, loving the Lord with all your heart and loving your neighbor. That's what, that, that's what, that's the, like, we can put it like this. Keep God's commandments. You know, we can do it kind of like this, all right? We can say, keep the commandments. So we just go, all right? And then we can say, it's two commandments. Bam, bam, okay? So one of them is love the Lord. So we're not going to write it all. We're just going to, LTL, love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul, all right? Then we're going to say, and love your neighbor. L-E, alright? So we got the Word of God, which we're going to find out is what this top one is. And then, and then, because we're going to find out what our next pieces of scriptures, the next two spots we're going to, that every word that come out of God's mouth is law and or command. Alright? But then you got love the Lord with all your heart and love your neighbor. And on these two commandments hang the other ten. So what you could do, if you wanted to make it like that, we can take this, this side right here and pull four branches off of it. And it would be your first four commandments. Your fourth being the Sabbath day. Alright? And this is how you would show the first four commandments is how you would show the Lord that you love Him. Then you take the other six and, you know, uh, you know, love, the first one is honor your mother and your father. And I'm not, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to, I, I'm not putting it all out here specifically. I'm just trying to get you to see. So under these two great commandments would be the ten. Now under the ten commandments, for example, one of the ten commandments says thou shalt not commit adultery. That's how you show you love your neighbor. So that would be on this side. We just say it's over here somewhere. Under adultery, 
will fall homosexuality, bestiality, uh, fornication, whatever else. All the commandments are going to fall just like that. So all the law is going to fall like that. So when we read the Bible and it starts telling you, you know, lie not one to another, that's saying don't bear false witness. Because bearing false witness, brothers and sisters, is when I say I saw him do something he didn't do. Okay? But still, though, that lying is if I just don't tell the truth. You understand? Well, that's two different statements. But, not, but lying still falls under not bearing false witness. And then in the Bible it tells you, lie not one to another, in Leviticus uh, 18 or 19. Okay? So that's how that's how the commandments work, okay? So it says here in John chapter uh, I mean Psalms 86, it says, Doesn't it say in your law that ye are God? And we saw that Jesus quoted from Psalms. So that means everything you read in Psalms is law. So when you go read and it says, Who shall abide in your home? Because you gotta understand what the law is. The law is the truth. Let's go to our next set of scriptures and we're gonna establish what the law is. See, that's the, the law, and it's a word that we even use commonly today. For example, we have what we like to call the law of gravity. And it's supposed to be true that what goes up must come down. That is law, that is truth. All right? But when you deal with God, we got law, we got truth, we got righteousness. All this stuff is what God's law is. But we're going to see that real shortly. So we're going to read Psalms 142. And when you get there... Psalms 119, verse 142. When you get there, go ahead and read. What's that right? Thy righteousness is thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. And thy law is the truth. Okay, so notice here, he said, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and the law equals the truth. And for those of us that don't know math that well, this equal sign is is. So what this is on this side and what this is on this side is supposed to be the exact same thing. So we saw that the, in the, according to the scripture, the truth is the law. That's why when it says what goes up must come down, that's a true statement. So that's why it's called the law of gravity. Okay, so the word of God is the truth. So it is law. This is what we're learning so far. So again, we're establishing, before we can get into the punishments for sin, we are trying to establish uh, sin is what sin is, which is when you break the law. Okay? So let's read our next one, verse 160. Thy word is true from the beginning. So now he say the word is true from the beginning. Alright? And true and truth is a variation of each other. So the law, the truth, and the word are all the same thing. Keep reading. And every one of thy righteous judgments endure forever. Okay, so notice what else he said. He said, all the Lord's righteous judgments endure forever. So that's why the commandments and stuff, they still good to this day. All his righteous judgments good to this day. Verse 151, go ahead. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are true. So now what it says is, he called the commandments, all of them, true. So that means the commandments would be the law, the word of God would be, this is, if you follow what we're getting at, we are qualifying what his law is. Now remember we read that Psalms is the law, because Jesus said, doesn't it say in your law, ye are God? And he was quoting from Psalms. Now Psalms is telling us that the truth is the, truth is the law, the commandments is the truth, or the commandments is the law. Hey, the, the word of God is the law. And that's what, we, that's what we're establishing right now. Go ahead, verse 172. My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Okay, so now he's saying his tongue, all the commandments are righteousness. So now, and we got other scriptures that will show you, don't worry about that camera coming back. We got other scriptures that will show you that your righteousness is the keeping of the commandments. So he said all the commandments are righteousness. Now let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 8 here. Because again, sin is when you break God's law. But now what we're doing is establishing what God's law is. And you have to be able to definitively say what is the law. Meaning, you know, if I want to come rebuke this brother, I can't rebuke him for having a beard. 
Because he, because because what he can say in response to me is, okay, what what law did I break? What word of God have I broken to say I can't have this bill? Now, if he's sitting here and he drunk six days out of the week and smell like liquor when he come up in here, then now we can go and find somewhere in the scriptures where they're like, bro, not only did you not operate in sober mindedness, but you a drunkard. <laughs> and we can find in the scriptures where drunkards, they're not going to inherit the kingdom. So I got something definitive to show this brother where he's right or what's wrong. That is how, that is what the law is. It's just like when you go to court. If they they can't pull something out the air to say you did something wrong. You know, they can't be like, oh, well, you know, you was doing 55, but the speed limit say 65, but they're going to make you pay a fine because you were going under the speed limit, and they're going to say, well, everybody else was going faster than you. They can't pull that number on you. And that won't fly. They might try to fake you out with that, but that's not the truth. The fact of the matter is there has to be a law there to punish you on. And it's the same thing with the Lord. When it has to be a law, it's something you have to have done wrong definitively. Okay? Let's read this Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1, 2, and 3. Go ahead. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord sware to your fathers. Mm -hmm. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, mm -hmm. whether thou would keep his commandments or no. Go ahead. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that men do not live by bread only. Go ahead. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord do man live. Okay, so this is what we're getting at here. Now, again, the class title is The Wages of Sin is Death. And this is what we operate in. We operate in life and death. So now the Lord told the children of Israel, you know, look, man don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Once again, we see the word up here qualifying what the truth of commandments are. So if we break what thus said the Lord, then what we're doing is we're sinning now. That's how. That's where we qualify sin. So if you don't do what God say, then you are a sinner. You live the life where, on the, the for example, I give you a person who's a sinner. Somebody go to church every Sunday. They're a sinner, y'all. I mean, seriously, because God said in the commandments, six days should work be done, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. In that particular day, you had your holy convocation, and you do, you know, you go to church. So when they pick their own day. Then they wrong. They're breaking what thus says the Lord, qualifying them as a sinner. And according to what we've read so far, they will be punished. But the question is, when? And we're going to get to that shortly. All right? Let's go over to Isaiah chapter 45 now. Isaiah chapter 45. We're going to learn a lot today. So far, hopefully today, we've been able to qualify what sin is. Because we're going to also learn why Jesus died on the cross. We're going to also understand why blood has to be shed. You know what I'm saying? We're going we're to get a clear understanding of the whole picture of what the Lord is doing with, with this whole death, resurrection, you know, all that because of how sin came on the scene. All right? So let's start this. Let's go over to Isaiah 45. Let's read verse 18 to 19. When you get there, go ahead. But thus said the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. Mm -hmm. He has established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord. There is none else. Go ahead. I have not spoken in secret. In the dark place of the earth, I said not unto the seed of Jacob, Seek ye in vain. Seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. So again, we just going back to where it said that, you know, in Psalms 119, verse 172, it said his words was righteousness. His commandments was righteousness from the beginning. So we still all tying this in to what is the law or what is the truth. What comes out of the mouth of God. If he say do it, if God said jump up 15 times every morning. That would be law. That's what you need to do. It's just like when God says, well, if you want your prayers to be heard, then you're supposed to face Jerusalem. Like when the Lord was talking to Solomon, he agreed to that. 
He said whether we get thrown out of our land or anything, if you humble yourself and you face this place, then your prayers will be heard. That's why when we get started in class, we stand up. We don't face the east. You know, we face Jerusalem. Because if we was in India somewhere, we wouldn't be facing east. We'd be facing west in that case, because we'd be facing Jerusalem. All right? So let's go over here to the beginning. We're going to find where sin entered the scene. Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to read verse 15, to 7, uh, 15 through 17 here. We're going to find the origin of sin on man. We're going to find the death sentence. Genesis chapter 2, and let's pick this up in verse 15. And when you get there, you can go ahead and read. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat it, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. See, when God made Adam and Eve, he actually made them with the ability to learn how to live forever. All right? He made, now he gave them a fleshly body, so that body was going to eventually decay away or was going to pass away. Right? But still, he wasn't going to make them have to taste death. Not at the aspect that we know. Because the reality is, or the funny thing is, and I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but death don't really exist for those that die. And when I say it doesn't really exist for those that die, it's because once you hit that, once you hit that line and it's over with, your next thoughts is gone. So the next thing you know is life again. You see, so it doesn't really, when you take it to that level, it doesn't really exist, you understand? Like, that's why the Lord calls it, on many occasions, he called it sleep. Because that's what it is, because you're going to awake from that. So when God made Adam and Eve, he made them so that they were going to be forever beings. All right? But he said, in the day that you eat it, now you're going to die. Now the rest of the people are going to see you pass away. All right? So now let's go on over here to Genesis chapter 3, and let's pick this up in verse 1. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. When you get there, go ahead. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of so the So now we in the garden of Eve. And we got this serpent here. And, and for those that don't know, this serpent is Satan. And it says he's more tricky or subtle than any beast of the field. Now, if anybody know about the animal kingdom, you would know this is not a literal snake. Because a literal snake is not the most tricky animal of the field. And when I mean a literal snake is not the most tricky animal of the field, because I don't know if you ever watched Animal Planet, but an eagle will run through a, 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 and just grab a snake and it's over with for him. Or even a mongoose, when they go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, he can't win with that. So the, a, a literal serpent is not the most tricky beast of the field. This serpent is Satan. This is what we're reading about. So he said, now, the serpent was more subtile than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. Go ahead. And he said unto the woman, yea, if God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And we read that, that the Lord said that you can't eat of these trees that's in the garden. Because the day that you eat of it, what's going to happen, y'all? You're going to surely die. Exactly. And when he's saying that you're going to die, we actually talking about you going to now have to go to the ground. And you're going to have to sit there where everybody's going to have the time going to progress. Because man would have just went and did kind of like Enoch did. When he said he tasted death. I mean, he didn't taste death. He went from one state to another. That's what man was going to do. Just like what we're going to do when the Lord return. Those that still living, you just going to go from one state to the other. But now what had to happen is because sin came in, now we got to go back to the dirt. And we got to sit there and we decay away. And we wait our time. We wait hundreds over hundreds of years to turn into thousands. All right? So let's keep reading this. Go ahead. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, right. but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Go ahead. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Uh -huh. For God do know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So this servant come on the scene, Satan come, and he like, look, you can, you can talk, listen to what I'm telling you. You're not going to die if you sit here and you chat with me. You ain't dead, die, is you? And the woman looking at him like, hey, you're making a good point. Like, maybe you're right. And I'm learning something here. So the serpent, but remember, the serpent was subtile and tricked this woman. All right? 
Go ahead, finish reading that verse uh, six. Thank you. Mm -hmm. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, go ahead. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did. And just so we'll know, and we got classes on the fruit we talking about was information. This is like it say you should judge a tree or a person, a tree by the fruit that it's in. Alright? So, and they say you're a good tree, can't bear bad fruit. You know, the scriptures are supporting this. But it was information that was given that was this particular fruit that, was, that gives us. And there's no apple that you can eat or an orange, pear, whatever, that can give you life or death. You understand? It's about information. Okay? So, this is what happened. But regardless, they ate from the tree. And now there's some consequences that's going to go with that. So let's read. Let's skip over here to uh, verse 17. Go ahead. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I command thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, uh -huh. and sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Go ahead. Thorns also and thistles shall bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. So now death then came on man. So again, this is the beginning, this is the introduction to what we're talking about. The wages of sin is death. The payment for what happened was death. Alright? But actually, and I guess I missed this in the class, um, let's skip back to um let's skip back to verse. Now keep reading a little. Uh hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, let's get back to verse 7. Let's get back to verse 7. We're going to find something else that took place here too. Go ahead. And the eyes of them both were so open. So this is after they ate from the tree. You say the eyes of them were open. Go ahead. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together. And made themselves able. Okay, so when, what happened is when they sinned, now they had some information to let them know that they was naked. So they went and took some, some, some material off the trees, fig leaves, and they put it on themselves because they knew they was naked, right? Now, let's see what happened after the Lord dealt with them a little bit, what he turned around and did. So let's go back, let's go over to um, verse 21 now. Verse 21. Verse 21, and let's see what the Lord turned around and did. We're going to talk about the significance of this here real <coughs> short. So we go ahead, read that verse 21 now. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin. Clothes. Okay, so we know they was naked, and we saw that God made coats, coats of skin and clothed them. Okay, so what did God do at that particular point? Exactly, he shed some blood. He killed something just died. There had to be a shedding of blood. See, man, yeah, I'm gonna kill man, but we understand that man just didn't live forever now. And that man reached a certain date, 900 and some change in Adam's, in Adam's case. But he didn't all go past this thousand year period. But the Lord still had to shed some blood. Does anybody know why he had to shed some blood? Okay, we're going to have to read this. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, does anybody know why blood had to be shed? Oh, without, uh, without blood, everybody right, but we're going to... We're going to look at something that the scripture says. Hey, no, hey, honestly, everybody's right. But we're going to look at something that the scripture says about the blood. Because there's something specific about the blood. Let's go over here to, um, let's go over here to, think, uh, I think we can find it in Genesis chapter 9. Um, let me see. Might be here. Now we're going to go over. Numbers 14. We're going to find this. So I know we add this to the class, but it's okay because I want us to make sure that we get this. And we understand why blood has to be shed. So, matter of fact, let's go over here to Deuteronomy 14. That's where we're going to go. Deuteronomy 14. And... Let me see. Uh, let's see here. Let's see, we looking for, uh, shoot. it's not there yet. All right, I'm going to tell you all the significance of the blood. The blood is what the life is, all right? So this is the significance of the blood, of why blood has to be shed for sin. Because he's telling you, and we gonna, I'm going to find it here, because I don't want to, I'm going to search it. 
so I don't have to take all day five. Uh, should you play okay. Oh, okay, it was Genesis 9. I'm sorry, y'all. Let's look at Genesis 9 and verse 4. Yeah, we'll look at that. And this is the reason why we don't drink blood. Yeah, okay, I found both of them where I want. So let's read that Genesis 9 and 4, and then we're going to read this other one, and then we're going to talk about this real quick. So go ahead, Genesis 9 and 4. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat? Uh-huh. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man... Okay, that's good. So he said, but the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood. So the life of, the, of anybody is blood. Okay? So now let's go over to Deuteronomy 12 and 33. And then we're going to talk about why blood had to be shed. Okay? But then we're going to come to an understanding on the fact that the blood of bulls and goats ain't enough though. Because remember, again, as we turn to Deuteronomy 12 and 33, again, we saw where when Adam and them said, they had, because they knew they was naked now, they had put clothes on. But God said, well, ain't nothing about the clothes when God, he went and killed an animal. And now when he killed an animal, he did something specifically, he shed some blood. So he had to see some blood for you, and we're going to see this throughout the rest of the class. That when we do sacrifices, we see some blood. Alright, so don't think on Johnny on the spot ain't nothing dying for your sin. It's stuff on this planet dying every day. You see what I'm saying? You never know why such and such dead now. You know why the Lord took out half of, uh, uh, or took out, uh, you know, a, a nice little portion of New Orleans. You don't know what type of sacrifice that was. You see what I'm saying? But because of sin, now we have death. Now we have the shedding of blood, and blood is where the life is. Alright, so he eliminated it with that. But we're gonna we're gonna get that. Let's go to uh Deut Deuteronomy 12 and 33. Read that. 23. 33, I'm sorry, 12 and 33. Yeah, 23. Oh, 23. Yeah, you're right, 23. I'm sorry now. Only be sure that thou eat not the blood. Uh-huh. The blood is the life. Thou mayest not eat the life of the flesh. So notice what we learn here also. You don't eat, and this is why you don't eat Pittsburgh rare meat. You know, I don't know if you know what Pittsburgh Rare is, but Pittsburgh Rare is when they take a steak and they get it dark on the top and dark on the bottom and it be bloody in the inside. You don't eat the blood, you know, because the life is in there. And this is what the Lord was doing when he killed that animal. He took life now for your life. Okay, so this is why blood, this is the significance in the blood. All right, so now let's keep it moving. Let's go over here to Exodus 32. Exodus chapter 32. So that's what happened. When you saw the first sin, we saw the introduction of death now. We didn't just see it in man, we saw it in the animal. And that's the only way I can make a coat of skin for you. Mm -hmm. Exodus 32, and let's pick this up in verse 1. And when you get there, go ahead and read. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain. So this is when Moses went up to the mountaintop. Go ahead. People gathered themselves together unto Aaron uh -huh. and said unto him, Up, make us gods. Right. We shall be, we shall go before us. Mm -hmm. Or as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, right. we woke not what is become of him. Uh -huh. and Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. Go ahead. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned them with a graven tool after he had made it a molten calf. Go ahead. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Uh -huh. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. So what we got going on here is Moses done went up to the mountain. Actually, he went to get the commandments. And now the people done got a little weary. So now they will start establishing their own righteousness down here. They're like, yeah, you know, this is the uh, this is the feast of the Lord here. You know, we're going to deal with this on that level. So on and so forth. They sinning now. This is what's going on. They making their own God. They sinning. Let's skip on over here to verse 17. I mean, to verse 19. And we'll find out the result of this sin. Go ahead. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted. Verse, verse 19. And it came to pass 
as soon as he came near to the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hand and break them beneath the mountain. Go ahead. And he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire, uh -huh. and grounded it to powder, right. and strawed it upon the water, and made the children of Israel drink of it. Okay, so first of all, he gets some punishment for this sin. So they made, he made the children of Israel drink this, this gold water. But go ahead, keep reading. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did these, what did this people unto thee? Mm -hmm. That thou hast brought so great a sin upon them. Okay, so we see a sin came upon the children of Israel. He said, what did this people do to you to make you make them sin like this? But what we're going to find out is with this sin came some death. We're going to see that. Go ahead, keep reading. Verse 22. Mm -hmm. And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods, mm -hmm. which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we will not what is become of him. Go ahead. So this is Aaron giving this explanation. We don't know what happened with this Moses. You know, so we wanted you to go ahead and make us some gods. Go ahead. And I said unto them, Whosoever have any gold, let them break it off. So did you, did you, he was trying to tell the way, so y'all got some gold, break it off, we go make a cat, whatever, whatever. Skip down to 25. And when Moses saw the, saw that the people were naked. We're not talking naked like as is as if they had no clothes on. They was exposed now. You know, their wickedness was being, they, they their trueness was being exposed of what they really were. So he said, when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. Go ahead, keep reading. For Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. Go ahead. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? So notice what's going on now. So now the question is being asked, well, who on the Lord's side now? Go ahead. Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together uh -huh. unto him. Go ahead. And he said unto them, Thus say the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out of and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. Go ahead. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. So if we pay attention, we see 3,000 men now died on this particular day of this scene, of them making that golden calf. And we can continue to number out uh, days. For example, as a matter of fact, let's, let's run over here to Numbers chapter 25 real quick. I'm going to give you another example. Numbers 25. So this is what happened. These people seeing that day, we say, we said, we saw when it said, well, you know, the people have done a great sin. So he killed three thousand people. He shed three thousand people blood that day. Let's look at this numbers twenty-five real quick. Pick it up in verse one when you get there. I'm gonna show you another example. And Israel abode in Shittim. Uh huh. And the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Right. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. Uh huh. And the people did eat bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. So you see here, now they worship, they dealing with him, they worship another guy. So now let's find out what happened here. Let's get down to verse, um, skip down to verse uh, seven, no, six, go ahead. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a uh, man No, nah, I'm just, go back up to verse three, start from there. Go ahead, read verse three. Israel joined themselves unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Go ahead. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. Go ahead. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. So they went and dealt with these other guys here in this particular time period, and we saw the, the Lord had him chop off heads, and this was actually going to please the Lord in this case. Keep reading. And Moses said unto the judges, Slay every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. Uh -huh. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought to his brethren a Midianitish. A Midianitish. A Midianitish uh -huh. woman in the sight of Moses, uh -huh. and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Go ahead. And when 
Phoenix, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it. He rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand, and he went in after the men of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. So notice here, death came upon, death came into the city of Israel so that the plague wouldn't come upon the children of Israel for the sin that took place. And read the next verse. Go ahead. And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. So 24,000 people had gotten, who had already died from this plague at this point until this Midianitish uh, woman was killed. And if you get into chapter uh, 26, you will see that the son of the congregation children of Israel, some more people got killed. So all we're getting at here is that your punishment for sin is death. And we sin that it's immediate. Although when we started off in this class, it said just because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore in the hearts of the sons of men is set forth to do evil. We're seeing it on the spot where people get killed for doing uh, evil. Alright? So now let's look at this Leviticus chapter 5. Leviticus chapter 5. We're going to start looking at um, some of these sacrifices again. So Moshe and the blood. Leviticus chapter 5, and let's pick this up in verse 1. So we've seen here the Lord kills for sin. All right? And, and, and we don't come to an understanding, though, that when it was all said and done, somebody had to die for your sin. We're going to get there. Leviticus chapter 5, pick it up in verse 1. When you get there, go ahead. And if a soul sin, hear the voice of swearing, mm -hmm. and is a witness, whether he has seen or known of it, if he do up, if he do not utter it, then he shall bury his iniquity. So notice here too, we say if a soul sin, that means of an individual. So we, as we like to say, we learning something on the way to learn something that you are the soul. All right, but let's skip on over here to verse five and go ahead. And it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. Uh huh. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin which he has sinned. A female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats, for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. Go ahead. And if he be not able to bring a lamb, then he shall bring for his trespass which he hath committed. Two turtle doves or two young pigeons unto the Lord. One for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. Keep reading. And he shall bring them unto the priest who shall offer that which is for the sin offering first, mm -hmm. and wring off his head from his neck, but shall not divide it asunder. Go ahead. And he shall sprinkle of the blood of the sin offering upon the side of the altar. And the rest of the blood shall be wrung out of the bottom of the altar. It is a sin offering. So what we're seeing right here is, back in the day, when the children of Israel was in the land, they had to make an offering for sin, and we see blood being shed for the sins of for sin as a sin offer. And what we know about the blood, the blood is what a life is. So really it's kind of like saying life for a life. This could be you, but instead we done took this animal's life. Alright, keep moving. Verse 10. And he shall offer the second for a burnt offering, according to the manner. And the priest shall make an atonement for him for his sin which he has sinned. And it shall be forgiven him. So, and then you receive forgiveness. Once blood has been shed, now you receive forgiveness. That's why when we was looking at in, in Numbers, he say, well, or in Deuteronomy, he say, or Numbers, he say, well, when that lady blood got shed, now the plague stayed. The plague, the plague has stopped now. And the, the number total is right here. This is how many people died for this. You know, and over and over, this is how you see in the scriptures, sometimes it be people that die. Like, just straight like people die for sin. As a matter of fact, when it's all said and done, uh, matter of fact, we're gonna jump, we're gonna jump the gun here real quick. Uh, let's go to Isaiah 24. I'm gonna show you. When I say we're gonna jump the gun, just because we can't, we got a little time. Don't worry, we ain't gonna be past our, our two hour allotment. But we're gonna go to Isaiah 24. I wanna, I wanna show you something that even when it's all said and done, blood gonna be shed for the remission of sins on this whole world. Isaiah 24, read verse one through six. When you get there, go ahead. Behold, 
Lord, make the earth empty. Uh huh. Make it waste. Uh huh. Turn it upside down. Go ahead. Scatter abroad the inhabitants thereof. Go ahead. So this we talking about when the Lord come back. This is what's taking place. Verse two. Go ahead. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, uh huh. As with the servant, so with his master. Go ahead. As with the maid, so with his mistress. Uh -huh. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the taker of usury. So with the giver of usury to him. He's just saying, every, this is going to happen to everybody. This, the earth going to feel this effect. Verse 3. The land shall be utterly empty and utterly spoiled. For the Lord hath spoken this word. Uh -huh. The earth mourn and fade away. The world languish and fade away. And haughty people of the earth do languish. Go ahead. The earth also is defiled under inhabitants thereof. So notice what it's saying here. The earth is defiled with the inhabitants thereof. Right? Go ahead. Therefore, I'm sorry, because they, they have ahead, they, thereof, thereof, because, go ahead. Because they have transgressed the law. So he said they done broke the law. The earth done broke the law. All right, so the earth has sinned. Go ahead. Changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. All right, now let's go to Isaiah chapter 34, verse 6. We're going to see what the Lord says. So we saw that the earth sinned. Isaiah 34, we're going to read one verse here. Isaiah 34 and read verse 6. So this is talking about when the Lord come back right here as well. Now watch what watch the, the wording here and we read this verse 6. Go ahead. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. So when the Lord come back, he said his sword is filled with blood. Remember we read that the blood is what a life is. So he said, I done took plenty lives, but go ahead, keep going. It is made fat with fat. Uh-huh. And with the blood of lambs and goats with the fat of the kidneys of rams, for the Lord have sacrificed in Bozrah. So he said, for the Lord have a sacrifice in Bozrah. This is for the sins of the world. When he come back, he gonna sacrifice, you wanna know who in Bozrah? Esau. Mm -hmm. So Esau, actually, when it's all said and done, is gonna be a worldwide sacrifice. Mm -hmm. like, like, so whereas before the Levites was killing a bull or a goat for sin, like we was reading it, breaking the neck of a bird, like we saw, but they ain't break the bird apart. That's what we was reading in Leviticus. You know what I'm saying? So where where we was doing that as a priesthood, as a priest for individuals, for the whole world, the Lord about to come back and slaughter Esau for the sins of the world. Because we read in Isaiah 24 where the world has sinned. And we seen that the wages of sin is death. So somebody got to die even for the sins of the world. And in this case, it's a whole nation. So when we get back into the land, it won't be no, and when we get back, when the Lord come back, it won't be no Esau no more. So if you eat a mite, you might have to live somewhere else. If you manage to make it through, you have to be somewhere else. Because you ain't even got no land no more. You really understand the physicality of it all. Because you were sitting south of Judah anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's where the wilderness is going to be. That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother subject matter. But what I'm just trying to get at is, this is how precise the Lord, everything the Lord is doing, it makes perfect sense. So when he started off for the whole beginning for the sins of the world, he killed it when Adam and them did it. He killed it now. Then we see later when the, when when we start setting up priests, he, we instructed priesthood in the death of animals, and blood had to be shed because we saw that's what a life is, life or life. It's just not your life. But we're gonna learn shortly that the blood of the blood of bulls and goats ain't enough. Alright, so we're going to get over here. Let's look at this Leviticus 16 and 6. You can look at chapter 6 later on your own time. We're just showing again that you blood got to be shed for your sin. But I think us going to Isaiah, showing it on a larger scale, really did the same effect. So let's go over here to Leviticus chapter 16, verse 6. And let's read this one verse here. This is during the atonement here. Read this one verse. Go ahead. Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself. So this is what he doing here. When he make an atonement, they going behind the veil, and they killing the animal, and they shedding blood. And Aaron, the high priest, had to kill the animal for himself before he could do it for everybody else. So that's why when you look at your prayers, like when you see Daniel pray, Daniel prayed, and he was like, you know, dear Lord, forgive me for my sin, and forgive Israel for theirs. So when you get on your knees, before you get to, because your prayers now are your sacrifice. Just so you know. So when you get on your knees and you begin to pray, make sure you pray for yourself first 
Just like how we see in these priests, how they sacrifice for themselves first, mm -hmm. and then you pray and ask for the forgiveness of others. So I don't know if anybody has ever caught, you know, us praying, you know, sometimes when you need prayer, we'll anoint you, or we be asking for forgiveness for ourselves first. Because we ain't nobody. Who is we? we? We just trying to follow some type of protocol. That's all. I ain't no better than Brother Tony. You know what I'm saying? Or, or Brother Nate or anybody else saying we just all people with sin on us. Mm -hmm. You understand? But there's a way, there's an understanding that you begin to get and you know how to operate within the, the lines and the rules of God. That will my, that, that's what might make me a little different from brother, uh, young brother Nate. You know what I'm saying? That I know the operations of God and what I can and cannot do. And we learn it right now that before you get to praying for somebody else, pray for yourself first. Mm -hmm. Get that sin off of you first. But that's what we see they did here at, uh, on the atonement. Let's go over to Leviticus chapter 10. We're going to pick this up in verse 1. Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 1. So again, the wages of sin is death. When you see sin, something got to die. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know you might want to get slick when you do some sin, go outside, kill a hand. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> some, but, but see, on the real no, no, some got to die for your sin, though. I don't want you to really think that's going to get it off you, but I'm right, just saying, right. something's going to be dead for your sin. Leviticus chapter 10, let's pick this up in verse 1. And we're going to see here Aaron, Aaron and uh, Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's sons, what happened with them. Verse 1, go ahead. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them in senses and put fire therein and put, and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. So they seen it. Nadab and Abihu, these were the, the, the big boy priests. Mm -hmm. These were the sons of Aaron. And they did a strange fire which the Lord commanded them not to. But remember, we understand sin is when you go against the word of God. Mm -hmm. As the Lord commanded them not to. Go ahead, keep reading. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them. So Asaph. See, and that's something else we got to learn and understand too. Too much is given, much is required. So it's like Asaph fire came from the Lord because the Lord was trying to show these people, look here, you can't be making those strange sacrifices. Me and think you're going to get away with it. That's why we ain't sacrificing now, y'all. Because we ain't going to do it right, and the Lord will be knocking us off ASAP. <laughs> just, like, just like when uh, the Lord told them about how to carry that Ark of the Covenant. That's right. You know what I'm saying? And they just wanted to carry it a certain type of way. And they went out there boundary, and the Lord had to kill them ASAP. Mm -hmm. So the Lord ain't got time to be playing with you making a mistake. That's right. You see what I'm saying? This problem was on purpose. But he ain't got time. That's why he's like, you know what? It's best for me to just go ahead now and we're going to send Jesus here because I'm going to be going to kill y'all. We're going to wipe y'all out of here because y'all can't do stuff right. You know, we got that can't get right syndrome. Mm. So he said, fire came down from the Lord and devoured and ate Adam and the Bible. Go ahead. Verse 3. Then Moses said unto Aaron, this is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come near me. So he said, I will be sanctified in them that come near me. This is what he's saying. You know what I'm saying? Like he's saying it just like I will be. That's why they did. I will be sanctified. Whoever going to come before me. That's why we don't make relations on the Sabbath day. Because we will sanctify ourselves before we present ourselves to the Lord. Because that's what he's telling us. Go ahead. Keep reading. And before all the people, I will be glorified. Uh -huh. Aaron held his peace. So Aaron, hold your peace, bro. I know your son is dead, but you might want to keep quiet on this one. Keep reading. And Moses called Mishael uh -huh. and Elspan, uh -huh. Elspan Go ahead. the sons of Uzziel, uh -huh. uncle of Aaron, uh -huh. and said unto them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. Go ahead. So they went near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. Go ahead. And Moses said unto Aaron, and unto Eli Eleazar, and unto Ithahar, Ithahar, Go ahead. his son, uncover not your heads. Neither rain your clothes, lest ye die, and lest wrath come upon all the people, but let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, be well of the burning which the Lord hath kindled. So he said, look, I don't even want you, you know, don't, don't get to crying about this, none of that. They dead now. You got a job to do. You step outside the lines of that job now, now you going to die. Okay? Because that's what it is with the Lord. He punished you for sin. And just because, as we started the class up, just because he ain't doing it ASAP right now, be glad. That's really what it boiled out to, but it don't mean that you're not going to go unpunished. That's right. All right, so let's move on now to Ezekiel chapter 18. And believe it or not, we, we, we moving along through this. I know I be adding scripture, but I be doing that on purpose. What's that? 
Yeah, I'm a little old school. I remember we had a, the paper out for me. Uh, with me car ass scriptures did it. It's just be your brother's <laughs> teacher. You know what I'm saying? And what happens is when you when you put a class together, you know how you want to flow, but you also got about 20 more scriptures that you wanted in there. And so sometimes you get in your mind, you like, man, nah, I only want to explain it. I just rather just read it to you. And that's all that is. You know what I'm saying? I want you to see it. I don't want me to just tell it to you. You know, so that that's what that is with me sometimes. But we're gonna get over here to Ezekiel chapter 18 and we're gonna keep it moving. And again, we're dealing with the wages of sin is death. Hey, Ezekiel 18, verse 4, go ahead. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. And the soul that sin, it shall die. So there we go. The soul that sin, it shall die. In this life and the next. You understand? Meaning if you maintain and you die in those sets of sin, then you're going to die what we call the second death and the next. But the soul that sin, all souls have now sinned. So we all going to die. Okay? But let's skip over to verse um, verse 9. Go ahead. Have walked in my statutes. But if you did this, if you walked in the statutes, go ahead. And have kept my judgments to, do tr to deal truly, he is just. He shall surely live, said the Lord so God. So that's the other end of the person. If you sin, you die. But if you uh, just and walk truly, then guess what happens? You get to live. That's that's how this works. All right. But we saw the death sentence come on Adam and Eve all the way in the garden. So we all gonna taste death. But remember, I said before, death don't exist. And you, and, but when I said, I said, but don't take it the wrong way. To the dyer, it doesn't exist. And to one other person, it don't exist. And I'm gonna show you that. Hold your spot here. Are we, yeah, hold your spot here. And let's go to Matthew chapter uh, 22. I'm going to show you something. I want you to know. I want you to comprehend when I say that devil don't exist. We're just talking about oh, it's asleep. And it's a temporary state. But when I say it don't exist, we're talking about like to, where it to who it matters to. So uh, uh, Matthew 22. And we're going to get right into the meat of it. Um, verse 28. All right, I know we adding this in here, but just pay attention. Just follow me with this. Because I, I keep making a statement, and I want us to comprehend. Because death does exist. Don't get it twisted. You're going to die, and you're going to return back to dirt. But I want you to understand that death is death is a word that we use. We're talking about going to sleep. We're talking about, but, you know, animals die, brothers and sisters. They never come back. You know, when your dog is gone, it's over with. You never had that dog again. There's no replica. There is no no that's that dog spirit coming back. None of that. Nothing like that. You can't mummify the dog thinking it's gonna nothing, nothing silly. All right. But watch what. But man, we're a little different. So when we start talking about death for man, it's not the first death that we gotta concentrate so hard on. Matthew 22. Pick it up in 28. Go ahead. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? But they all have. Okay, the story is a woman, she got married to a man, he died. So then what happened was he married the, she married the brother, and he died. And she married all these brothers because they never had no kids. So she married seven different men. So they said, well, in the resurrection, who wife is she going to be now? She done been married seven times. Now, Jesus, first of all, these folks didn't even believe in the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And Jesus say, uh, y'all y'all on some stupid level, because watch what he going to say about the resurrection. Go ahead. Jesus answered and said unto them, ye do err. Not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Go ahead. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So you say in the resurrection, just we don't function in being married and given in marriage. We don't, you know, we don't have husbands and wives in the resurrection. You know, we're all sons of God. Okay? Good. That, that's something I gave man to create with. I didn't give that to the spiritual world. We're on a whole nother level. But keep reading. Watch what he say. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God? Now this saying, is why I keep saying, you know, death really don't exist. And it does, but it's sleep. See, when we think of death, you out of here, you go back to the dirt. But when I'm, when I'm trying to get you to see death, look at death more like a, 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 a caterpillar in the cocoon. It's going to be something else sooner or later. Read what it says. Go ahead, 32. I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. 
God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Right. Now, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they all dead. But notice what he just said. I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living. Because with God, these people still exist. These people still alive. You know, and when I say they still alive, that's why he said your works, Father. That's why he said the blood of such and such cried from the ground. Right, because you still exist with God, then how is you dead? See, the dog you had, it don't got coming back here. So when we go back to this Ezekiel 18, you can go back there now. So when we go to Ezekiel 18, when he say the soul that sin, well, everybody know we all going to taste death, but we talking about everlasting life, and we talking about second death. So when he say the soul that sinned, it shall die, it was, it was to be taken literal, but the death that we most worried about is dying in them sins. And we can take a part of that like a fire, a second death. But let's, did we read verse 9? Yeah, read verse, let's go over to 20 now. So, the go soul ahead. that sinned. Ezekiel chapter 8, 18, verse 20. The soul that sinned. Go ahead. It shall die. Uh huh. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Right. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. Go ahead. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. Uh huh. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So he's just telling you something. Look. Now, Sean ain't got to be punished for what I done did in life. And when I mean punished, I mean go to hell for. Mm -hmm. You see, because he going to be punished for what I did in life. If, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. What I mean is, if I, if, if, if I was acting a fool my whole life, then chances are his life going to be a little worse because I acted a fool. You see what I'm saying? Because I put a situation around that, that or let, let's just take it on a broader perspective. We over here because of what our forefathers did. Right. So we're being punished for what our forefathers right. did. But at the same time, we're not going to hell for what our forefathers did. Mm -hmm. That lies on the individual. You see, so when he's saying here, he said, um, he said, but, uh, he said, the son should not bear the iniquity of the father. We're talking about bear the iniquity all the way to the grave of the father. You know, it's not like, um, Saul's son, Jonathan, got to bear the iniquity of Saul. But yet still, you, you see he got punished, though, with, 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 for, for Saul being the sinner. Jonathan had to suffer for that. Because he was rolling with his dad. He ended up dying just like his dad died. You, you follow the difference? So what I'm saying is, you know, it ain't to say just because you a son of don't mean you ain't going to get in trouble or reward from what your father did. It's to say that you don't have to bear that sin for what your parents did. But go ahead, keep reading. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he had committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Right. All his transgressions that he had committed... They shall not be mentioned unto him. Uh -huh. And his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Go ahead. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? Said the Lord God, and not that, that not that he should return from his ways and live. So this is all that the Lord really wants you to do, wicked, which we all have qual been qualified to be at some point, is turn from your evil ways and live. Mm -hmm. You see, so he said, "Look, when the righteous, when the evil turn, when the evil man turn from his way, all that stuff is is it's over with. You ain't gotta you you out of that now. This is where that grace card begins to come in. When the scriptures say you are not under the law but under grace, because the law or the truth is the wages of sin is death. Therefore, because of what you did, it's a wrap. You see, that's the truth of the matter." But the Lord say, oh, you know, I'm going to show you some grace. But we're going to get there because grace and truth came with Jesus. But we're going to get there. Uh, let's, so he say, uh, but when the righteous turn, we read 24. No. Okay, read 24. But when the righteous turn away from his righteousness uh -huh. and commit iniquity, uh -huh. do according to all the abominations that the wicked man do, shall he live? Go ahead. All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. So and what I want you to understand too as we learn something on the way to learning something is you ain't saved. Because this righteous man was saved but at the same time he went out there and started committing all the iniquities of the wicked. All his righteousness ain't going to be mentioned no more. So you must endure it to the end in order for you to have salvation. That's on the way to learning something. But go ahead keep reading. In his trespass that he have trespassed, and in his sin that he have sinned, and them shall he die. And so once again, we get into the moral of the story. The wages of sin is death. This is the, this is the reason we have this scripture in this class. Because it's showing you, don't matter if you sin, you die. Go ahead, read some more. Yet ye say, 
The way of the Lord is not equal. Uh -huh. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Or not your ways unequal? So he's saying, look, my way is equal. It's your ways is wrong. If you, I'm being as fair as possible. If you wicked, get right. If you righteous, don't go wicked. That's about as fair as it gets. That's what he's telling you. My way is straight. But what you two saying is, well, I did all this good, and now I want to go and play the harlot, so I should still be straight. That's the philosophy of once you say, always say, too. Right. That's not fair. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. That's what he's telling you. Alright, did you read 26? No. Read 26. When a righteous man turn away from his righteousness and commit iniquity and die in them, for his iniquity that he have done, shall he die. And again, when the wicked man turn from his wickedness that he have committed and do that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Notice what it say, you're gonna save your soul alive. Mm -hmm. Meaning you gonna see everybody gonna die, but we're talking about on a whole nother, a whole nother day. That's what being wicked and turning from your wickedness can cause you to get eternal life. Because all these souls is God. So it, he needs to put them where he wants to. This is his call. Let's move over here to John chapter 3 now. John chapter 3. We're about to go find that, that favorite scripture that you see at all the football games. We're not starting at verse 6. We're starting at 16. Actually. John 3 and verse 16. This is the one that everybody knows. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to see if we can't pull this one into a class and make a little more sense out of it. John 3 and verse 16. And I bet you know this one without even reading in your Bible, <laughs> don't you, uh, DeMarcus? Go ahead. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So that's what we're dealing with here, having everlasting life. So he said, God, he said, for God so loved the world, because remember we read in Isaiah 24, the whole world has got this evil on them. So the sun is what's going to actually be the token of, uh, uh, of life for his, his blood that's going to get shed to get a world life. Go ahead, keep reading. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. So he said, well, he sent the son. Now Jesus came in and this statement is getting made because Jesus really still was confirming the covenant with the world. So he like, look, this is what righteous and wickedness is. He's still telling you that. But he said, I'm not telling you this to condemn you. I'm actually trying to save you. And the reality is my death is what's going to really save the whole world. But keep rolling. He that believe on him is not condemned. Uh -huh. But he that believe not is condemned already. Go ahead. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Go ahead, keep reading. And this is the condemnation that, <clears throat> that light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So he said, look. He said, I, you know, it said, he that believed on him is not condemned. So if you believe, because remember when Jesus came, he came still teaching the commandments. So if you believe on him, then you coming from up under the condemnation is the death that was put on you for your sins. He said, but if you don't want to do what he say, that's what he mean by believe. Then therefore, then you, then he says, uh, if, if, but if he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten of, begotten of God. And this, is condemn, uh, and this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world. So Jesus was that light that came into the world. He's the way for you to get salvation that came into the world. So you must believe on him. Then it says, uh, and men would rather have darkness than light. We'd rather, we'd rather be wrong than right, basically. In so many words, that's what he was saying. So let's go on over here to, uh, oh, keep reading. For well, everyone that do evil hate the light. Neither come to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Right, because when, when, you, when you love evil, then you stand in that darkness. You hate the light. And what the light is going to do is going to reprove your deeds. It's going to show you who you are. Because that's what the law does. The law shows you, hey, look, you know, you're a murderer and thou should not murder. You know, you, you, thou should not covet. It's showing you not supposed to lust. You know, this is what the law does. The law shows you, the law is here for the ungodly, not That's for right. God. That's right. See, the God, like God don't need no law. You see, he established the law. He walked within it. But the ungodly, I need to show you, look, today the Sabbath day, you dealing with something else. You know, today, if you sleep with a woman, like I tell you in Exodus, you're going to take her to be your wife. This is what the, you need this for the ungodly. 
You see, not the godly, because I don't have to tell you the godly that, because like we talked about last week, the godly going to operate within the realms of, okay, well, you know, we're going to arrange this, make a covenant, and now, you know, we'll confirm the covenant after our, after our marriage, after our wedding. You see? So you don't need no law for that. Whereas the ungodly, well, you're going to go out there and put the ruby to the tootie first. So now it's a law in here, Exodus 21, to tell you what to do. It was something we talked about last week in Bible study. You know, it say, well, then you're supposed to go and, and, and take this woman to be your wife. You see? So at any rate, he says, for everyone that doeth uh, evil hated the light, neither cometh uh, to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So it basically just saying, the ones that want to act right, they're going to walk within the commandments. But Jesus, the whole point of us going here is to show you that Jesus brought into this world to to save this world. And we're, we're going to find out how he's going to save this world. Let's go over here to Isaiah 53 now. Isaiah 53. Isaiah chapter 53. And we're going to pick this up in verse 5. And when you get there, go ahead. But he was wounded for our transgression. Talking about Jesus. He was wounded for our sins. See, something had to die for uh, something deeper than just, uh, uh, you know, an animal had to die for sin. Go ahead. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, he was healed. All right, let's, um, let's go back a little bit here to verse 3 and read verse 3 and 4. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Go ahead. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And notice something else, too, how we was like, you know, he was despised and rejected of men. We read that in, in John chapter 3, and this is talking about the same person whose stripes healed us. Let's get down to verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. So notice what it said his soul and his body was an offering for sin now. So we saw a, a, that, you know, the world's offering for sin was Bozra. And we saw under the Levitical priesthood, your offering for sin was some blood of bulls and goats. But we see that for, for man as an individual, your offering for sin was Jesus' blood. Go ahead, keep reading. He shall see his seed and he shall prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. All right, let's go over to Hebrews chapter 10 now. Hebrews chapter 10. We almost done here. Hebrews chapter 10. And we're going to pick this up in verse 26. Hebrews 10 and verse 26. And when you get there, you can go ahead and read. For if we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remain no more sacrifice for sin. Okay, so now we have already established what sin is early in the class. Sin is when you break God's law. So he's saying if you're going to break God's law uh, willfully, just like I'm just going to do it, I'm just going to buck the system, then there is no more sacrifice for sins. Now, that means that there is no bull, no goat for sin, but then more importantly, you can't be killing Jesus for your sins willfully. All right, go ahead, keep reading. But a certain fearful looking for a judgment and fiery indignation. So notice what it's saying here. He said it's not sacrifice for sin. It's lake of fire for sin if you go sin willfully. This is what he's showing us here. All right, go ahead and keep reading. We shall devour the adversary. And that lake of fire was made and intended for the adversary. This is what he's telling you in verse 27. Go ahead. Verse he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three weeks. So if you despise Moses' law, you got killed on the spot. And this is we saw some of that, even though we didn't look at everything, but we that's what happened under Moses' law. We saw an old the Midianite woman get, you know, she the spear ran through her. We saw heads get chopped off. We saw um uh, and uh, Nadab and the who get killed for the strange sacrifice. If you despise the law under Moses, you died ASAP. Go ahead. Of how much more, of, of how much sore punishment suppose ye? So he said, it's going, he said, what type of punishment you think you going to get? Go ahead. Shall he, shall he be 
thought worthy. Because you was thought worthy. Go ahead. We have trodden on the foot the Son of God. And have counted the blood of the covenant. So he's telling you, he's, he's classifying us now. We have counted the blood of the covenant. We just saw all that took place in the past. We, have, we see Jesus' death. We see that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. His blood was shed. He said, now, if you're going to sin willfully, do people back in the day, they didn't have, it, they, they died without, uh, without mercy under the mouth of two or three witnesses, ASAP, in their sin. You done got some grace. So when you come despise, despite the spirit of grace, let's see what happened. Go ahead. Wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and have done despite unto the spirit of grace. What you get is that fiery indignation that we read about earlier. If you uh, been counted the blood of the covenant and you don't receive the spirit of grace. Because we're going to read that too about being under grace and not under the law. So he said, you done got this, but you're going to go out here and you're going to say it willfully what you think you're going to get. You're going to get it. Watch what this next verse say. Go ahead. Well, we know him that has said, vengeance belong unto me. Uh-huh. I will recompense, saith the Lord. Right. The Lord said, I'm going to get you for this. That's so why we go all the way back to our first scripture in Ecclesiastes when he said, the sinner will not go unpunished. Even though execution against the evil work is not done swiftly, like we saw in the past, it was swiftly. He said, but they go, go punish. We gonna punish them. But we talking about second death now. We talking about what is all said and done. Like it says in Psalms 37, Fred, not thyself or evil doers. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like they gonna do what they do. You know, we gonna see, you know, uh, uh, Birdman and Lil Wayne and Puffy and <laughs> they gonna live their life and, you know, we gonna be in the background of the closet like, yeah, he's homosexual and all that. But they gonna be, they gonna be getting it big time though, right? right. But then on the day of judgment, guess what? They go to hell. Mm. See, for all that big time they got in this life, mm -hmm. they got, whereas we maintain our integrity. That's right. You know, so we ain't sell out to that life. So therefore, we get salvation. You see? So at any rate, he said, for we know uh, him that, say, that has said, vengeance belong unto me, and I will recompense, said the Lord. And again, the Lord should judge his people. Verse 31, go ahead. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians 15 now. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to look at this verse 20. So he said, look, well, we read in Hebrews 10 and look, when you decide that you're going to go out here and say it willfully, you trying to kill Jesus. Oh, Jesus was your remission for your sin. See, the blood of the bull and goat, they was killing that often. They could do that every year, but it never really got them from up under their sin. It really was just a show to show you something greater that was going to get you from under your sin, which was Jesus. That's who was really going to get you from under. But you can't kill Jesus, but works, though. So since you can only kill him once, then that's all. That once, you, once he gets you from up under your sin's past, that's supposed to be a wrap. You're not supposed to be out here sinning with him. But you, you got the spirit of grace. First Corinthians chapter 10, I mean 15, to pick it up in verse 20. Go ahead. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept. Okay, so now we, so we we looking at the death of Jesus, and it said, but now he's risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept. But pay some more attention. Go ahead. But since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. So death came by Adam and Eve. We saw that in Genesis. But now since death, because because uh, death came by man, now man got to give you life. Not an animal, or not a blood of an animal. Go ahead, keep reading. For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Would you please close that door? Thank you. So he say, um, for as in Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Okay, because remember, the punishment of the way that the sin is death. So in Adam, everybody's dead. You see? And really, even though Jesus killed an animal right then, even though they killed animals left and right for their sins, that wasn't going to give them life. Mm -hmm. Jesus had to die. Another man had to die to give them life. Let's go understand that. Hebrews chapter 10 again. That's what Paul was telling you. But it wasn't so much just the death, it was the resurrection. See, with those animals that they killed every year, once they was dead, they was dead. It was just the blood that was like, kind of like, okay, I see some blood being shed for you, I, I spare you. But this is only to a point, uh, to a set time. All right, this is what that whole, this is what that priesthood was established for. 
this priesthood was established because men is sinners and I need to make sure they got a way to get from off their sin. So I don't kill them. This is what the priesthood was here for. See, before Leviticus priesthood was here, we were under Jesus priesthood known as Melchizedek. You see, it was still sacrifices going on back then, but Abraham wasn't out here just sin and needing a sacrifice every week. Job wouldn't work, run around here need sacrifices every day. He would sacrifice for his kids every day, but he wasn't walking around here as an evil man. So now I need to establish this priesthood because even in the midst of me giving them this crap, I'm killing off people by the thousands. They not even, I'm, I just opened up the Red Sea and I still got to kill 25,000 people talking about this who brought us through over here. Yeah, we need some kind of way for me not to kill all of y'all. Alright, so he established the priesthood. But never once could that priesthood save them. Hebrews 10 and 1. Go ahead. For the law having a shadow of good things to come. Now when we reading the law here, we're talking about the law that was established to uh, uh, to get you from up under your sins. So he said, for the law having a shadow of good things to come. Go ahead. And not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers there unto purpose. So he said, look, with them killing some animals, some bulls and goats, it never made the individual perfect. Go ahead. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. Uh-huh. Because the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. So he said, look, for then would they not have ceased to be offered. Talking about uh, if, the, if, if the sacrifice that they did year by year could make you perfect. Then that means I was sacrificed one time and I wouldn't have to sacrifice no more. But it doesn't make you perfect. So he says, now, because the worship of one's purge will have no more conscience. So I still got a conscience of sin. So we got to kill these. We got to do this every year. Every year we got to kill an animal, bull, or goat. So it's not making you perfect. Go ahead. But in those sacrifices, there is remembrance again made of sin every year. He said, even in those sacrifices, you're going to remember sin every year. Keep reading. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. So here it is. The, the blood of bulls and goats, it's not possible for that to take away your sin. So even though we was killing that stuff, it wasn't giving you, it wasn't saving you yet. Keep reading. Wherefore, when he come into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings, thou wouldest not, but a body has thou prepared. This he is talking about Jesus. He says, so when Jesus come into the world, the one we read in uh, John 3.16 that was here to save the world, when he comes into the world, he said, look, I don't need a body. I mean, he said, uh, sacrifices and oblations, thou wouldest not, but a body has been prepared. Verse 6, go ahead. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Uh -huh. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Go ahead, talk. This is Jesus still talking. Keep reading. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not. Neither has, neither has pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Okay, so he's saying here, above when he said sacrifice and offers and burnt offers and offers of sin, for sin, thou wouldest not. Neither had, so he said, all that that he was telling them to do back then, he never really had pleasure in them doing it. So meaning like, look, when you go and you have to make a sacrifice for your, a sacrifice for your sin, I wasn't happy about that as God. I'm looking at you like you did it again. You said it again. That's really how you're looking at it. Not so much, oh yeah, great, now you off your sin. It, it made the Lord remember your sin over and over again. Go ahead, keep reading. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He take away the first, that he may establish the second. So he said, look, Jesus said come, so he said, look, I come to do thy will, O God. I'm going to take away the first so that we can establish the second. I'm going to take away the first set of sacrifices so that we can establish Jesus doing the sacrifice for your sin. Go ahead, keep reading. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. Uh-huh. So he said, look, we set apart through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. So we don't need no uh, animal to do this no more. Go ahead. And every priest stand daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice, which can never take away sin. Again, he said these priests do this daily, but that same sacrifice can never take away your sins. Go ahead. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, 
sat down on the right hand of God. Uh -huh. From henceforth, expect until his enemies be made his footstool. So he said, but now we have somebody that's going to be a, a permanent sacrifice for your sin who went and sat down on the right hand of God to his enemies was made his footstool. Talking about Jesus. Go ahead, keep reading. Well, by one offering he had perfected, perfected for every, every, forever. For, by one offering he had perfected forever them that are sanctified. Uh huh. Where so he said, like one time. Not a whole, not every year, but one time he perfected this. He made this perfect. He made this right. Go ahead. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he should said he should have said before this. For after is, that he had said before. Go ahead. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. Uh huh. Said the Lord. Go ahead. I will put my laws into their hearts. Right. And in their minds will I write them. Uh huh. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And this is what we were looking at in Ezekiel. He was saying, well, when a man turned from his evil way, then he won't have no more remembrance of your sin. So now he's saying, um, well, under this new covenant, he was like, well, I'm going to go ahead and put my law in their heart and in their minds, and I will remember their sins and their iniquities no more. This is how we're going to, because remember, with the sacrifice every year, you know, that, that, um, you know, that consciousness of sin was there every year. What we trying to do is get that whole consciousness of sin out of our mind under this new covenant. Okay, then Jesus came along with this well, this new covenant. But keep reading. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So he says, sin, if we have remission or, or, a, or a final payment for your sin, then there is no more necessity for a yearly sacrifice of sin. Because we got the ultimate payment, which was Jesus in his blood. Go ahead, keep reading. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Right, so he said, now we, got hope. now we can enter in by the blood of Jesus, not by the blood of some animal. Well, like how you how you look how you look being covered under the blood of an animal for real to the Lord, you know like you ain't no animal. The animal didn't do nothing. You see what I'm saying? That, like that's the reality of it. That that's how that really looks. Now he don't get it twisted. The animal saved them coming to body eat you, but it saved them from death that night though. It didn't save them from eternal life. You need something to save you from eternal life. You're gonna need the shedding of man's blood, or as we saw Jesus who came in and saved the world. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, keep reading. By a new and living way. Which so having verse 19, therefore, brother, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, go ahead. Which he had consecrated for us through the veil, through the veil that is to say his flesh. Right, so that basically the new and living way, it was the flesh and the blood of Jesus. This was the this was the, the more perfect way for you to get salvation now. Not by the blood of bulls and goats. Let's go over here now to, to uh, 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to go back there. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 15. Wait a minute. Am I looking at my paper wrong? Did I skip 1 Corinthians? No, we read that. Uh, I skipped Romans chapter 5. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, we can go to Romans 5. I see what I did. That was my fault, y'all. That was my fault. We can go to Romans 5. What was that? Oh, I ain't know. <laughs> I ain't even skip that. Let's go to Romans 5. Romans chapter 5. You did that a little out of order, y'all, but it's okay. Yeah, I see what I... Oh, I don't know what I did. I just skipped around like crazy for no reason. Let's, Romans chapter 5, let's pick this up in verse 6. When we get there, go ahead and read. But when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Yeah, man, this was going to work way back. Okay, so <laughs> it was. Okay, so basically, we did already establish that, though. Like, with nothing we could do, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for the sins of the world. Okay, let's skip down over to verse 9 now. Much more then, being now justified by his blood. All right, now pay this attention now. Our justification now comes by the blood of Jesus. This is important because we're about to, we're not going to do the job. We're going to go from here. When we're done with this Romans verse 21, we're going to go right into chapter 6. So it's important that we that we capture this. Go ahead. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Mm -hmm. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled by God by the death of his son. Okay, so we pay attention to a few things here. He said, look, much more now uh, being now justified by his blood. 
So your justification to God is not, is, it, it is the blood of Jesus, not the blood of an animal. Alright? Then he says, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Talking about we're saved now through the, uh, uh, from, uh, from the wrath of God. That we read about when he said uh, fire and indignation. Then he said, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we should be saved by his life. So he's saying, look, we, re we are now reconciled or, or mended back together with God because Jesus has now died. Verse 11, go ahead. And not only so, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So he has been made now the payment for man's sin, because remember the punishment for sin is death. Right. But go ahead, keep reading. Wherefore, as by one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So by one man, by Adam, sin entered into the world. And then death came because sin entered into the world. Go ahead. And so death passed upon all men. And death came on everybody because of Adam's sin. Go ahead. For that all have sinned. For until the law sin, for until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. We've established that already a little earlier. Just if, if there is no law, then you if there's nothing wrong, if there's no law to say what what is uh for example, there's no law to say you can't chew bubblegum. So then we can't say you chew a bubblegum and see. There's no law to say you can't uh smoke a cigarette. So, you know, you might try to play well, it's not good for your health. Okay, well, I mean, if you go outside and you run for 18 straight hours, that's probably not good for your health either. I mean, you know, we can just start saying all kind of stuff ain't good for your health. You see what I'm saying? But the fact of the matter is, we're talking about what is sin. So he said, for until the law, sin was not in, in the world. Sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed where there is no law. Verse 14, go ahead. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam's most. So he said, from death, death started with Adam. And it came from Adam to the law got here. Because Adam had sinned. You see, Adam had broke the law. But we read in Psalms 119 that his law been here forever anyway. That's why if you go into the writings of uh, Cain and Abel, he say, well, when Cain killed Abel, you sinned, Cain. That's what you did when you killed your brother. You murdered. Even though it wasn't on textbook that it was murder. You see, it's still because we read in Psalm 119, his righteousness being here is everlasting. It's all, his commandments, his law always been here. All right, his right and his wrong always been here. Keep reading though. Even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, uh -huh. who is the figure of him that was to come. Go ahead. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. Go ahead. For if through the offense of one of one many be dead. So the, by the offense of Adam, everybody died. Go ahead. Much more the grace of God uh -huh. and the gift by grace, Go ahead. which is by one man, Go ahead. Jesus Christ, uh -huh. who have abounded unto many. Have abounded unto many. So he's saying, look, just like by one, this death came on everybody. He's saying now, by one now, this free gift, this grace, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through... The offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God. So this grace of God came through Jesus. The grace of God is that you don't die for your sins. That Jesus has died for your sins. No. Go ahead, verse 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. Uh -huh. The judgment was by one to condemnation. Right, so the judge, Adam brought us to condemnation. But remember, we read Jesus didn't come to condemn. Verse the middle, go ahead, keep going. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. So this free gift is going to be for many unto justification. For all, this is what justifies you. And you got to comprehend that fully. Go ahead, keep reading. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Uh huh. Much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. So he said, for by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Much more they which receive abundance of grace uh, and of gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. So he's saying that, look, death came with Adam, but Jesus gave, through his gift, he gave eternal life to everybody. Keep going. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, uh -huh. 
Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So again, he just repeating the same thing. Condemnation came by uh, Adam. The uh, uh, justification of righteousness came through Jesus. Keep reading. For well, as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Uh -huh. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Go ahead. Moreover, the law answered that the offense might abound. But where sin abound, grace did much more abound. Go ahead. That as sin had reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So he said when sin reigned unto death, then he said, but at the same time, grace that Jesus brought, that gave us eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. But let's go into chapter 7 because I kind of messed up. Skip, I mean, skip the before. So we're not going to do the John 8. We already read Hebrews 10. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Pick it up in verse 1. Go ahead. We shall say then. What shall we say then? I'm sorry. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Go ahead. God forbid. So notice what he's saying here. Now remember, your justification came by the blood of Jesus. So he said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The answer is God forbid. Just because Jesus brought grace in it, so now you're not getting punished for your sins, Johnny on the spot. That don't mean you continue in it, but go ahead. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Uh-huh. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized unto Jesus Christ Go ahead. were baptized into his death. Uh -huh. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory, by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Go ahead. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Uh -huh. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So he said, look, so you don't got yourself justified by the blood of Jesus now. So he said, well, well, do you continue in sin? No. Just because you're not dying in your sins now, you under grace, you don't continue in sin. Then he said, no, you're not. He, he's explaining why you don't continue in sin. He said, look, we would, so know ye not that so many of us as were baptized unto Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore you buried with him by baptism. So he just said, just like he resurrected from the grave, you supposed to come up out that water and be resurrected so that you not sinning no more. Alright? Then he said in verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Verse 7, go ahead. For he that is dead is free from sin. Mm -hmm. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Go ahead. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, die no more. Death have no more dominion over him. Uh-huh. For in that he died. He died unto sin once, but he that but in that he lived. He lived unto God. Go ahead. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. So he said, just like Jesus died, you suppose likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. But go ahead. Alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So notice what 12 gonna say. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. So he's saying, look, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. So he's telling you, like, look, reign as in rule in your mortal body. So this is the objective that we're supposed to be eliminating the thoughts and procedures of sin in our mind on a daily basis if we resurrect it with Christ. But go ahead, keep reading. 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness uh -huh. unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God. So when he's talking about yielding your members, he's literally talking about you as an individual. Don't yield that stuff over to unrighteousness, but yield it unto God. Go ahead. As those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto God. Read that again. As members, as instruments of righteousness, righteousness unto God. Uh -huh. Verse 14. For sin shall have, for sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. So now when he said, well, sin won't have dominion over you, so you are not under the law, but under the grace. The law that we're referring to now is the fact that the wages of sin is death. This is the law that was over you, that was killing you. and that. But he said, well, grace, now you got grace now. Now you got the death of Jesus, so you don't have to suffer for your own sins. Somebody else is. 
Go ahead, keep reading. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. So he's saying, well, what you doing? What you gonna do? You're gonna go out here and sin anyway because you're not under the law. The law of what? Sin and death. But under grace. Go ahead. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves service to obey, his servant ye are to whom ye obey. Uh-huh. Whether of sin unto death. Or of, or of obedience unto righteousness. So he's saying, look, this, this, this is going to put you on one side or the other. He said, wherever you yield yourself service to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey. So if you're going to be righteous, then that's who you're going to serve, that's what you're going to do. But if you're going to be unrighteous, that's who you're going to serve, that's what you're going to do. I'll give you an example. Look at Judas. Judas was already unrighteous. So it was, it was nothing for the Lord to use Judas to betray Jesus now. You know, he yielded his member to that unrighteousness, so that's what happened. But go ahead, keep reading, verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Uh-huh. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. So he said, look, when you became free from sin at your baptism, then you became a servant to righteousness now. Go ahead. I speak out that a manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members service to uncleanness and to an iniquity, unto iniquity, uh -huh. even so now yield your members service to righteousness unto holiness. Okay. For when ye were the service of sin, ye were free from righteousness. So he's saying like when you were sinning, you didn't even know how to really live in righteousness. Go ahead. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. So again, that's what we pointing at. That the end of what you was doing before is death. If you would have stayed in that lane of being unrighteous. But at the same time, because you have turned from your unrighteousness now. And because you are now beginning to do that which is lawful and right. Now that can put you under the new covenant of being under Jesus and his blood. That can justify you now. So now you don't have to die for your own sins. But go ahead, keep reading. But now being made free from sin uh -huh. and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Go ahead. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay. Let's go over to uh, 2 Corinthians now, chapter 2. I mean, chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we almost done here. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And pick it up in verse 11. So, when it's all said and done, when we get to the wages of sin and death, we should have learned today that, look, first of all, we should have learned what sin was. Then we see that from the initial sin, blood was shed. We went to learn and found out why blood was shed. Blood was shed because that's what the life was. Then from there, we even moved forward to show you that, you know, they, they sacrificed. Blood was getting shed when they were doing their they yearly, their monthly sacrifice or whatnot. Then we even showed you that the world sinned, and we showed you that uh, Bowles Rock is even a sacrifice for the sins of the world. But then we showed you Jesus is the one that's going to actually take the sin off per individual that Adam put upon man. Because Adam was the one that put sin upon all of men. So when we look at where it says the wages of sin is death, in that same chapter is where we see, you know, you are not under the law, but you are under grace. What law are we talking about? We're talking about the law that put death upon you, which is sin. Because the truth of the matter is, if you sin, you're supposed to die. But you're not under that law, you're under grace now. Okay? So now let's look at this uh, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, pick it up verse 11. You get there, go ahead. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remain is glorious. Uh-huh, so when he, because he did away, he did away with what was past. Your sins, that first covenant, all that. He said, but that which is, he said, but that which remain is glorious. Go ahead. Seeing then that we have such hope, we us, we us great, we use, we use great plainness of speech. Uh-huh. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Uh -huh. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remained the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, 
which Baal is done away in Christ. Go ahead. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. So he said, look, he like, well, we use plainness of speech. I mean, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil on his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfast look on, look to the end of that which is the Bible. Because when Moses had went up to the mountain, he came back. You know, he, his face had his glow on it. So, you know, he had to put a veil on it so that the people couldn't, because they wouldn't, couldn't take that glow. He said, because their minds were blinded. For unto this day remain the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. So when the world reads the Old Testament, they don't see, they don't see how none of this. They don't comprehend what we comprehend the writers. But keep reading. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. But this is really why we came here. Go ahead, read verse uh, 17. Go ahead. Now the Lord is that spirit. Uh -huh. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So he's telling you where the spirit of the Lord is, you get liberty. Liberty from what? From death. Because that's what the law say you're supposed to have for the payment of your sin is death. But according to the law, now you can get liberty. According to Jesus, and if you get his spirit, you can now have liberty from that punishment or from that payment. Let's go look at our last verse here. Genesis chapter 4, let's pick it up at verse 7. Genesis 4 and verse 7. There's one verse here. Genesis chapter 4. Let's pick this up in verse 7. When you get there, go ahead and read it. If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? So if you do well, you will be accepted. Go ahead. And if thou doest not well, sin lie at the door. Uh-huh. And unto thee shall be his desire. And thou shalt rule over him. So that's the that's the whole the bottom line. If you do well, then you'll be accepted. You'll be fine. But if you don't do well, then sin is going to lie at the door. And we know that the punishment for your sin is death. So with that being said, brothers and sisters, I hope we learned something. And I thank you for your time.